it was about one week after I had made a profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that the man that pointed me to Christ invited me to his house in uh, Birmingham, Alabama uh, for a meal. And, and so uh, I showed up at the appropriate time and uh, he was amazed. He said, you're here on time. I said, yeah, I learned that from my father. He said, son, if you tell somebody you're gonna do something, he said, you do it. The only options are you die. And I said, uh, so I'm here. I told you I'd be here at a certain time and I, I was here. So uh, anyhow, we went in, had a nice meal and I was a little bit uncomfortable. I was still smoking at the time. And after a meal, of course you want a cigarette. And so I asked him, I said, do you mind if I smoke? And Mr. Borland said, no, we'd rather see you smoke than climb the wall. He said, go ahead. Well, I put the cigarettes back in my pocket and I didn't smoke that day. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, I had a great visit. They encouraged me. And then when I left, uh, his uh, teenage daughter, who was going to the University of Alabama at the time, was there. And uh, they all three prayed for me. And, and th they all three prayed practically the same prayer. And it was something like this. Uh, Dear Lord, please give Joe the abundant life that you've given us. I, I never forgot that. Three times he prayed, she prayed, mother prayed, daughter, the daughter, all three of them prayed. And they all prayed that I would experience a life worth living. I, I never forgot that because as I drove away from their house that day, I thought to myself, I, I wouldn't wish my kind of life on anybody. And they had something so wonderful, so good, so satisfying that they wanted somebody else to have it. <clears throat> Last week, we introduced our little two-part series on how to have the abundant life. First of all, what is it? Well, it's not having everything at your disposal. It's not being free from trials or problems, but it's having a, an inner joy, a security, a confidence, peace with God, knowing that all is well. Uh, I'll tell you, dear friend, if, if you know the Lord, you can lay your head down at night and sleep on the, sovereign, on, on the pillow of the sovereignty of, of God and, and wake up the next morning and keep going. I mean, God is in control. God is overall. You're in his family. There's peace, not war with God anymore. And that abundant life comes from within, not from without. And so we've taken 2 Peter chapter 1, the first 11 verses, and uh, we talked about sort of a three-part outline. Uh, the first part, the first uh, four verses we talked about as being the foundation, got everything that pertains to life and godliness. We talked a little bit about the divine nature that Christ, the thrice holy God of Israel, actually lives in your heart. Uh, we talked about Christ being the cornerstone, the foundation stone. No other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid which is Jesus Christ. And, and so we reminded ourselves of the true solid rock of the Lord Jesus on which we stand. And then we suggested in verses five to seven that there's some building material. I ask you to imagine in your mind a foundation and over uh, against that foundation, you've got a, a pile of building material. And uh, we suggested that verses five to seven actually represent for us things that we can add, things that we can expand to, expand our faith with, manifest our faith with. And uh, we talked about five of the seven of those last week. We'll pick up with that this morning, Lord willing. And, and then tonight, I'd like to finish off this little series by talking about the finished product. That is, if we, by the grace of God and his strength, 
have done what he's asked us to do, there's an abundant entrance. Uh, I, I mean, you won't be ashamed at his coming. Uh, it'll be a grand day to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. And it'll be a, a great day when he presents us to himself, uh, a spotless bride. And so we need to work out our salvation. And, uh, and we're, we're going to talk about that tonight. If these things be in you, there's consequence, there's result. If these things are not in you, there's consequence and there's disappointment and failure. And so let me read for you now. You watch your Bibles, please. And let me read for you the first 11 verses of 2 Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all things, that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things be in you or are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We'll end our reading there. <coughs> Excuse me. So last week we started adding to our faith. That is, we suggested for you that we were going to expand our faith. We're going to manifest our faith. We're going to um, take which is given to us, that pile of building materials, that to, pertains to life and godliness, and apply them to our life, live them out, and uh, begin to experience by obedience, by the grace of God, this, this wonderful, abundant life that Christ has died to give us. Um, I, I asked you last week, let me ask you again, are you glad to be alive today? I mean, are you happy in the Lord? Or maybe your circumstances are awful. Uh, I, there's a fellow here at the Pembroke Bible Chapel, and he's been confined to one room uh, for, uh, I don't know, almost two years now. He's in a home, can't get out, then COVID hit, and then you can't get out at all. and uh, on occasion, before uh, they closed it down, uh, I could, I'd go in and see. Matter of fact, on Sunday afternoons, my wife and I would go over. Sometime one or two of the other brothers would go over, and we break bread with him. He did, he just can't get out. Imagine confined to one room, an effort to get to the washroom. He's one of the happiest guys I I know. He's rejoicing in the Lord. He certainly cannot rejoice in his circumstances, they are awful. But as Paul would say, not that he was a prisoner of Rome, but that he was a prisoner of Christ. 
And this dear brother would say that he enjoys the Lord. You know, he told me two weeks ago, he spends four to six hours a day reading and studying the word of God. Oh my goodness. It's unbelievable. He's got the joy of the Lord. He's praying, he's reading, he's studying. He's making the best out of a, a, a bad situation. How can he do that? He's experiencing the abundant life. That's why. What's your life like? What's mine like? You know, the older you get, conversations all center around what? Doctor's appointments or some crazy thing. Uh, I had an operation. Well, I had a bigger one than you did. And oh my goodness, it goes on and on. What about the abundant life that Christ has died to give us? So we talked about virtue, knowledge, self-control, patience, uh, godliness, and then last week, we stopped with brotherly kindness. And I want to pick up with that and go a little further uh, this week, this, this morning. Brotherly kindness. Uh, whenever I think of brotherly kindness, I think of Ephesians 4 and 31. Be ye kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another even as God, for Christ's sake, have forgiven us. Did you get that? Be kind to one another. I mean, if that alone, if, if, if that characterized your meeting, kindness to one another, it revolutionized our meeting. I, I mean, it's unbelievable. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted. We get hard-hearted. Someone, someone comes in and go, oh my goodness, I hope they don't get into that again today, you know. Uh, we get hard-hearted. We get cynical. Uh, we, we, we avoid people because we think we know what they're going to say or do or get into. And uh, rather than uh, preferring one another, uh, we, we avoid one another. Uh, listen, I don't have the answer. There's some people that tell you the truth. I don't really enjoy being around, but I'll tell you one thing. Jesus' blood had to be shed for them just as much as it did for me. I mean, they are an amazing value, and I put such little value on them, and I'm ashamed of myself sometimes. As much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. This loving uh, brotherly kindness thing, um, someone put it like this, to live above with saints we love, well, that'll be glory. To live below with saints we know, <laughs> that's a different story. <laughs> but, but friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, let me tell you something. There is a fellowship that is to be recognized by the world that the world does not have. Jesus himself said, they'll know that you're my disciples by your love one for another. Paul would remind us in, uh, in uh, Romans chapter 12 uh, to be kindly affection one to another, in honor preferring one another. You see, evidently, and in those days, and probably it's, it's the same today, uh, you love your family, right? Uh, your mom, your dad, your, your, your children, your, your siblings. I mean, there's a family bond. But you get outside of that house, you get to that next apartment or that, that neighbor that lives next door, and, and all of a sudden, I don't have the same respect or kindness or tenderheartedness or forgiveness for them that I have for my family. Well, what Paul is saying is this. We're to be known for people who love uh, our family. Guess what family we're in? It's called the family of God. You know, uh, I, I'm so glad to be a part of the family of God. We call one another brothers and sisters, at least to their face. Let us not have hypocritical love, Paul says. I, I shouldn't even tell you this but I am. I was at a place, let's say it was on Venus. I'm not going to give you a hint where it was. And, and I was there early for the evening meeting. 
And I was in the parking lot and parked in the corner of the parking lot and the first car came in. It was an older man and his wife. It was a summer day, my window was rolled down, their windows were rolled down. And the way he spoke to his wife and treated her, I was embarrassed for her and for him. They didn't see me, they weren't paying any attention to me. It was, it was terrible. You, you shouldn't talk to a dog the way he talked to his wife. And then they went into the meeting. And, and then I came into the meeting later with some other people. And you know what? He was the most likable, the most tender hearted, the most gracious, the most loving and kind brother that you see in that meeting. That was hypocritical love. He didn't love his wife like that. Th this is the whole point. Brotherly kindness. Listen, who's not hypocritical? We all are. We're at best unfaithful servants. I understand that. But we got to work on it. Add to your faith. Manifest your faith. You know the biggest room in the world, don't you? It's the room for improvement. And this is a great opportunity right here. Brotherly kindness. Did you know that brotherly kindness is, is a uh, evidence of eternal security? Yeah. Uh, uh, let me just read them for you. We don't have time to turn to these passages. If you're taking notes, 1 John chapter 3, verse 14. Listen, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. I, I, I mean, if we would evaluate some people's lives, we'd say they're not saved. They don't love the brethren. But one of the evidences of salvation is that we love the brethren. Uh, 1 John 4 and 21 this is the commandment that we have from him. Uh, uh, he that loves God should love his brothers also. Uh, 1 John 3, 16, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And then the Lord Jesus in John 13 and 35, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, <laughs> not by your doctrine, uh, not, not by the way you meet, not by church government, but by your love. How do they know that we're disciples? Kindly affection, in honor, preferring one another, taking the back seat, not the front place. James even warns us about that. Enough said, I can really get off on that one, but let's, let's love one another with a fervent and a pure heart. Work on it. I know you're not doing it perfectly, neither am I, but let's work on it. That's what we're asked to do by the master. And, and, and then lastly, in the list, he says, and add to brotherly kindness at the end of verse seven, love. You say, well, yeah. Let's see, love is the glue that sticks it all together. <laughs> I mean, lo lo love makes it happen. Uh, th th this is not, you know, this brotherly kindness. That's that's phileo love, that's family love, that's uh, loving one another in an earthly way, okay, respecting one another. But, but this is God's love. Uh, this, is, this is the love that loves the unlovable. We've heard that. This is the love that loves regardless of how people respond to that. Now, now let me just uh, uh, encourage you for a minute. Love is a word of action. Like if there's no corresponding action, you don't have love. Now turn with me, please, to John's gospel and chapter 21. Gospel of John. And last chapter, 21. You remember the story, the Lord Jesus uh, speaking to uh, Peter, ask him a question. <laughs> and... Uh, the, the question is very uh, interesting. N notice it, uh, verse 14 of John 21. This is the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples uh, after he was raised <coughs> from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, 
do you love me more than these? That, that's a great question and a great controversy. And we, we're not going to really try to even answer that. Just watch the question. Do you love me more than these? He said, yes, Lord, uh, you, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him then, feed my lambs. Keep reading. Uh, he, he said to him a second time, Jesus did, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep of 17. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Notice the response now. Peter's grieved. I mean, he's offended. He's hurt. He was grieved. Because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And, and he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Regardless of everything else, I think we can agree on one thing. Jesus said, if you love me, there must be corresponding action to prove it. Would you, would you agree? You love me? He said, yeah. Okay, then uh, do this. Feed my lambs. Uh, do you love me? Yes, I do. Then feed my sheep. Do you love me? <laughs> yeah. He's exasperated. He's grieved. He said, oh, my goodness. I told you twice already, don't you? He said, if you do, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. There must be corresponding action. Listen, you can raise your hands and beautifully sing, uh, Jesus, I love you. But if there's nothing, if there's no action, if there's no evidence, good luck. It's just words. Okay. Uh, John 14, please go back to John 14. Let me show you the principle. John chapter 14. Love is the love of actions. Got to have corresponding action to prove it. Okay. I look at John chapter 14 and verse 15. If you love me, Jesus said. Now look at it. Keep my commandments. He didn't say if you if you love me, say it. He didn't say sing it. He said, do something. Keep my commandments. Look at verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them. It is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him. And we might pause at that point and say, how would we know that? And manifest corresponding action, manifest myself to him. Do you get it? Look at verse 23. Uh, Jesus answered and said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. God, listen, stepped out of heaven one day to prove his love. God so loved the world that he did what? Corresponding action gave his only begotten son. Love is a love of action. God commended, demonstrated, manifest, showed us action uh, that he loved us and that Christ died uh, for our sins. Love is a word of action. We might call that, that's the duty of love. Go to Luke chapter seven, Luke's gospel, chapter seven. And notice um, verse 30, uh, 30, 36, Luke seven and 36. I, I don't have time to read the whole thing. Uh, Jesus is at a Pharisee's house, Simon. Uh, he's having supper. While he's there, a woman comes in off the street, and she uh, brought some uh, uh, fragrant oil with her, an alabaster flask of oil. She stood behind him, verse 38. Uh, she washed his feet with tears, dried them with the hairs of her head, and anointed his feet with this fragrant oil. At verse 39, when the Pharisees saw it, uh, who invited Jesus to come, he said within himself, he's not talking out loud. He says within himself, if, if this man was a prophet, he'd know all about this. 
Uh, Jesus answered in verse 40, well, I do know all about this. Thank you very much. And so he tells him a story. Uh, in verse 41, a man, uh, there, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed uh, 500 denarii, the other 50. When they had nothing to pay, uh, which one of them would love him more? He asked, verse 43, uh, Simon answered and said, well, I, I suppose the one that he forgave the most. And he said, you're right. Look at verse 44. <clears throat> Jesus turns to the woman, turns to the woman. But he says to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered into thy house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she's washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has kissed my feet, uh, has not ceased to kiss my feet uh, since the time I came in. Uh, you, you did not anoint my head with oil. She's anointed my feet with fragrant oil. 47. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Listen, this is a whole study in itself. We get one major theme from this. Love is always a word of action. In verse 47, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. <clears throat> you say, well, how would you know her sins are forgiven? By her action, by what she did. You see, uh, she loved, now listen carefully, she loved much because she was forgiven much. Now, you can't turn that around. You can't say she was forgiven much because she loved much. <laughs> that'd, be a, that'd be a salvation by works, see? It's not how much we love the Lord in order to be saved, to get forgiveness. But when we are forgiven, he says, if, if you understand how much you have been forgiven to that degree, you're going to love. Let me ask you the question, how much you've been forgiven? You say, well, I was saved when I was six, and uh, I'd really, you know, I just, my mother led me to the Lord, and I just trusted the Lord, and, you know, and uh, I mean, I wasn't that bad, but uh, I got saved. Well, let me ask you this. How much do you love? You see, my wife was saved as a little girl. I was saved out of a cesspool of sin. You'd say, well, Joe, you probably love the Lord more than your wife. No, you know what? I think my wife loves the Lord more than I do. You see, she understands God delivered her from a cesspool of sin. He delivered me out of a cesspool of sin. We were all lost. We were all going to save, or going to hell. Uh, all of us need to be saved. Christ had to die for all of us. But how do you understand it? If, if you understand and what you have been saved out of or what you have been saved from, and you really get that, you know what that will do? Cause you to love the Lord much. So we might say that's the degree of love. To the degree you understand how much you have been forgiven, to that degree, you're going to love him. And then watch something. When you love him, what's going to happen? It's going to be corresponding action corresponding there's going to be evidence there's going to be a lifestyle there's going to be proof about that okay then go to second timothy chapter two second timothy chapter two and there it is i thought someone had taken it out of my bible second timothy chapter two now, we're thinking about the duty of love, uh, keep my commandments. You, you don't have to tell the Lord you love him. I mean, you can if you want to. But if you keep his commandments, he'll know. <laughs> if you keep his word, he'll know. Uh, I, I mean, you don't have to go through all this big rigmarole. He says, if a man loves me, he'll keep my commandments. Okay, all right. Uh, we also understand that to the degree I understand how much I've been forgiven, to that degree, I will love him. Now, notice the desire. I'm going to call this the desire of love. Uh, verse, verse three, uh, Paul writing to Timothy, he said, you must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Verse four, 
No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Pause. Why? Why doesn't he get involved in the affairs of this life? Why doesn't a soldier care what's going on in the civil world? That he may please him who's enlisted him as a soldier. I, I don't have a lot of time here, but just let me say this. Why do you do what you do? Please your wife? Uh, look good at the chapel? Please your elders? Uh, so I can have a successful business? So I can look good in front of other people? Why do you do what you do? Why do you serve the Lord? Why do you uh, volunteer yourself? Why do you study or preach or, or usher or uh, teach Sunday school or cut the grass or why do you why do you do what you do as a Christian do you do it to, because you want to please the Lord that should be your desire just one illustration Old Testament uh, David is holed up in the cave of Adullam uh, Philistines are gathered around I mean the next day is going to be a fierce battle he, he's trying to figure it out, and he thinks to himself, man, I wish I had a drink of water. I am so thirsty from the well at Bethlehem. Three men in that cave without any command, their ear tuned to the voice of the king, backs out of that cave under the cover of darkness, breaks through. That's the language. They broke through the Philistine garrison, got to Bethlehem, dropped the bucket, got the water, back through came into the cave and gave it to David. I mean, David was so taken with the whole thing, he would not even drink the water. He wouldn't even drink it. He said, this represents the blood of those men who risked their lives to bring me the water. Why, why'd they do that? To, to impress the other 30? Uh, so that they might get a, a raise on the job? Uh, so that they might, their reputation be built up. I tell you why those men did that. Are you listening? They love the king. They love David. They do anything for David. They wanted to please the one who did enlisted them. The desire of love. One more, Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And uh, verse, verse 4. Revelation 2 and 4. Uh, uh, this is the letter to the church at Ephesus. And the Lord is speaking. And uh, he said, you've done very well, but you got a bit of a problem. And uh, verse 4, nevertheless, I have this against you. And notice, you have left your first love. Don't, don't ever misquote that and say you, you lost your first love. You, they didn't lose it. They did not lose it. Uh, listen, love is a decision. It's a decision. Stop loving the world. 1 John 2.15. Uh-oh. I really like it. It's really fun. I'd like to go play more out there, you know, but don't do that. Stop loving the world. It's a decision, not a feeling. Okay. So he, he says to them, you left your first love. You know what this word, this word left means abandon. It, it's like a divorce. It's like you walked away from your wife or your husband. It's like I am out of here. I am done with this. I am gone. You left your first love. Now, let me tell you how I know that is true. Look at the next verse. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. You just kind of like go backwards, okay? Just like trace your steps. Oh, that's, that's where it was. It's very subtle, but that was the first step. And then it got further, and then it, and the little foxes got in, yeah? And the little sins, yeah? And then, oh, my goodness, I'm... He said, go back, trace it. And when you figure that out, repent 
And now notice something, do first works. Well, if you're going to love the Lord, why you got to do first works? Because those first works were motivated by love. I mean, I can remember saying to the Lord, uh, Lord, I'll go anywhere, headhunters, crocodiles, you know, it doesn't matter, uh, asphalt jungle, uh, anywhere, wherever you want me, I'm ready, I'm in, I'm in, why? I wanted to do it because I loved him. I, I don't know where you are, but I tell you, this is a sad story of Ephesus, but about 30 years later, they walked out. They walked away. They left. And, and the way we know people leave their first love is they don't have any works that are motivated by love anymore. Oh, I'm going through the motions. It's, it's big business, you know, church. And, uh, oh, yeah, I go every Sunday. I do this. I do that. King David figured that out in Psalm 51. Sacrifice and offerings you would not, but a broken and contrite heart, oh God, you'll not despise. D David lived under the law system. You had to bring a, a lamb or a bull or a goat or whatever. You had to bring a sacrifice. David says, I, I, I got this figured out. It, it's not the animal you're looking for. It's the attitude of my heart. It, it, it is not how I... You know, Ephesus did a lot of things right. They were going through the motions. They were doing this, taking sides, resisting, persevering. He said, you, you walked away. In your heart, they didn't walk away physically. They're all still going to church. But in their heart, they had. And they had to come back. Well, <clears throat> my, my time is up. I just got one story for you. I have a friend, his name is Ramalingam. He's uh, East Indian, uh, but he's born in Singapore. I, I, time would just not allow me to tell you this man's story, but he got saved in prison in solitary confinement back in 1970, 71, 7071. And uh, by 1981, uh, he is visiting death row in, in the Singapore prison. And uh, there were 18 men on death row in that prison that tried to steal gold bars from a business in Singapore. They were caught in the process of trying to steal those gold bars. Uh, they killed a man and all 18 of them uh, were, uh, were guilty. And all 18 men of those, uh, all 18 of those men were going to hang for their crime, capital punishment. He, he went into, he said when he went into Singapore to the prison, he said, um, uh, anybody in there want any help? Uh, he said, tell them don't call me till they've tried everything else first. He said, when, when they have no hope, call me and I'll go visit them. I'll, I'll give them the gospel. So he, he said, uh, uh, 16 of those 18 men made a profession of faith. They were young, between the ages of 18 and 35 years old. They were all illiter illiterate. They, they, uh, they made a profession of faith. He said, I had one year to get them ready to meet Jesus. Did he get that? Discipling them to meet the Lord. 16 out of the 18 were saved. He said, the day came. They're going to hang them. He said, I was there. He said, they, they came by me. They gave him a last meal. They put on a clean set of clothes and there were three gallows and they were going to hang. I hung them three at a time. He said, when they came by me, he said, I knew I, I, I wouldn't see them again on earth. And he said, I will. And he said, one of them wept, uh, said, don't, don't weep, Ramalingam. He said, I'm going to see Jesus. Uh, they, they witnessed to their executioner. They all walked in under their own strength. He said, most of the men, the hardest criminals, when they see the gallows, they just go like jelly. They can't even walk and they drag them in. All these men walked in. He said, one came by and said, Ramalingam, don't weep. I'm going to see Jesus. And then he said, um, do, do you have a message you would like for me to give to Jesus for you? Imagine that. That guy standing 
18 inches away from you in five minutes is going to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. He said, with tears streaming down my face, the only message I could think to send to the Lord was this. Tell the Lord, I love him. Add that to your faith. I mean, be absolutely hypocritical if your life doesn't show it, right? Love's a word of action. Tell the Lord. I love it. Well, tonight, by the grace of God, we're going to find out if you add these things, what happens? And if you don't, what happens? Let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you for reminding us of great truths, great possibilities. Uh, awesome life to be lived, abundant life above the ordinary, and certainly above the life we had before Christ. Oh God, thank you for everything that pertains to life and godliness. I pray for myself and I pray for these dear ones today. Let us never take the Lord for granted. Let us never forget how much we've been forgiven. And let us love with a fervent love our wonderful Savior, the Lord Jesus. Amen.